Welcome to worship with North Haven Church this week. And what a week it's been. I know we're all tired after being quarantined with the pandemic, which has taken a psychological and a mental toll on all of us. And I know we're tired of seeing injustice seem to rage unchecked in the world around us. I know we are tired. But don't lose faith, North Haven. Then don't give up. For our God is doing something grand right now. And eyes are being opened all around us to the plight that people of color have been experiencing, to the stories they've been trying to share with us for a long time. Oh, don't lose hope. The storm is raging. But our God is one who calms the storm. He is God not just of the weather, but over the human heart. And I believe, profoundly believe, that we are right now in a pivotal moment, a nodal moment, where God's kingdom is breaking through. Oh, the powers of this world resist. Oh, they resist it. They shake like an enemy that's been struck a death blow but still rages on to fight with its last energy. God will win. God always wins. And God will win in the same way that Jesus won. Through self-sacrifice and compassion. Through the doing of justice for the least of these. This is the hope on which our faith rests. This is the song to which our hearts sing. This is the energy that propels us forward even in the dark of night. Don't lose hope, North Haven, because our God is at work. This is our worship. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. North Haven. I'm coming to you this morning from the Saturday Black Lives Matter protest in Norman. And I want to read a prayer today from Mary McLeod Bethune. Father, we call thee Father because we love thee. We are glad to be called thy children and to dedicate our lives to the service that extends through willing hearts and hands to the betterment of all mankind. We send a cry of thanksgiving for people of all races, creeds, classes, and colors the world over and pray that through the instrumentality of our lives, the spirit of peace, joy, fellowship, and brotherhood shall circle the world. We know that this world is filled with discordant notes, but help us, Father, to so unite our efforts that we may all join in one harmonious symphony for peace and brotherhood, justice and equality of opportunity for all men 
The task performed today with forgiveness for all our errors, we dedicate, dear Lord, to thee. Grant us strength and courage and faith and humility sufficient for the tasks assigned to us. Amen. this reading from the book of Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost? until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Amen. The classic interpretation of this parable, which I think is a good and true reading, is that Jesus is the shepherd who leaves the 99 to find the one lost sheep. Jesus, in our story, was just being criticized for eating with the unclean, the sinners and prostitutes. The religious elite weren't cutting him any slack for that kind of behavior from a so-called religious leader. So Jesus responds by telling them a parable. And the them... The audience in this story is really important because it's, it's not the one. It's not the sinners. This story is told to the 99, to the religious elite. And the classic interpretation shows us that Jesus is a shepherd that searches for even the one and goes and rejoices when he finds it. 
how do the 99, these religious elite that he's preaching to, how do you think they feel about this parable? Because it's a beautiful story if you're the one. One of my favorite New Testament scholars is a Jewish woman named Amy Jill Levine, and her understanding of Judaism is a keen asset in her study of the New Testament. And she advocates for a wholly different reading from this classic one. The text never says that the one looking for the sheep is the shepherd, she points out. And in fact, it would be absolutely incompetent for a shepherd to leave the 99 to find the one. For when the shepherd returned, he would have a flock of only one. In the classic interpretation, this sort of recklessness is a beautiful trait in God when it's directed your way, when you're the one. But what about when we are the 99? When we are the religious to whom Jesus speaks? So instead, Levine argues that the text implies that the sheep owner, not the shepherd, but the owner as a different person is the one who goes looking for the lost sheep. And that it's also the owner who is responsible for losing the sheep in the first place. And since God doesn't lose us, she argues that it doesn't make any sense for God to be the owner searching for the sheep. That's the real thrust of the parable, she says. And here it is. The religious elite whom Jesus is telling this story to are those who have been entrusted with the care of all the sheep in this Jewish religious system. They are those who have failed to be good stewards of all of those sheep. The sinners and the outcasts who should have been brought into the fold, those who dined with Jesus, well, they weren't welcome in the religious system that these elite had created. And so, this parable is an indictment against the elite for leaving no place in God's house for everyone. And what these elite should have done, what the religious people ought to do, is to be like this owner and leave the system behind if they have to. This owner leaves his wealth behind in order to journey out into the wilderness to find those whom the system hasn't served well. (laughs) It's a pretty different way of interpreting the story, isn't it? And I think it's one that finds immediate application in our time. See, the last few weeks, I've been consumed with the news about the deaths of Ahmaud, Arbery, of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, and then all of the subsequent protests. And I can only hope that we're at a tipping point where American society wakes up to the fact that systemic racism is still a real and present danger for so many Americans. That racism has never really gone away. It's just changed and evolved over the years. It went from slavery to Jim Crow to education inequality that that really persists even to this very day. From there to redlining and a busted justice system that has led us not just to the far too frequent killings of black men and other people of color, 
but to the mass incarceration epidemic that unjustly affects these same black men and people of color to a staggering percentage. Well, and I could go on and on, but that's just to name a few. Overt racism is easier to spot and frankly easier to address than systemic racism. What makes systemic racism so evil and so difficult to fix is that it's no one single person's fault. There's no one person to blame. It makes it possible for a bunch of people to follow procedure to the best of their ability and still end up with a system that dramatically disempowers people of color. But just because it's more complex to fix. More complex to fix doesn't let us off the hook. On Wednesday nights for the next few weeks, we're watching The Color of Compromise. It's an Amazon Prime video study that's based on the book, The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the Church's Complicity and Racism in America by Jamar Tisby. And he makes a compelling argument, like many, many people before him, that the American church, with far too few exceptions, has historically been complicit in racism, either through outright support of it or silent indifference to it. Here's where everything comes full circle. Like the religious elite to whom Jesus spoke, the American church, and I should clarify the white church in America, has historically loved power and privilege more than justice. Through the white church's historical negligence, silence, or sometimes their outright bigotry, liberty and justice for all is the lost sheep in our system. And it's time that we pick up and go searching for it. It's time that we leave the racist systems behind and preference the one disadvantaged over the 99 as Jesus did. That's why I say black lives matter. Because it's black lives and the lives of people of color that are in danger right now. But this is also where the interpretation of the parable gets real dangerous, actually. And I don't use the word dangerous lightly. It's, see, any metaphor that's taken too far breaks down eventually. And this one has a very clear breaking point that needs to be articulated perfectly clearly. In this interpretation, black people are not sheep, and we are not owners. The point of this interpretation is much closer than that. The, this interpretation serves to show those in positions of privilege and power that their leadership hasn't been for the good of everyone. And it's important to focus energy and resources on those who have been lost in the system. That in fact, we may need to leave the system behind altogether in order to find justice for all. In Levine's interpretation, it's important to point out once again that it is not the lost one's fault. She puts the owner, the owner is the one at fault for not taking care of all equally. And that's a really important distinction. And that's, that's the big picture conversation with this text. But what does that mean for us today at North Haven? You might be wondering. We're not slaveholders or Jim Crow supporters. And we're not on the city councils that 
uh, supported this redlining, and we're not the police that brutalized. So what does this possibly mean for me? And I think that's an appropriate question. I am filming this on Saturday. I went to the Black Lives March today and waited to write and film this until after that because I wanted to be able to let those experiences weigh on me. And there I learned about, and I'm, I'm going to not know how to say this name right because of well, that's a symptom of white privilege, frankly. Marconia Kessie, I think. Marconia Kessie, who went to the Norman Hospital two years ago almost, two years ago almost right now, actually. Kessie went to the hospital in severe mental and physical distress. He was examined quite poorly as the story will illustrate, and then he was discharged. Kessie, knowing something was seriously wrong with him, despite the discharge, refused to leave the hospital. Well, the police were called, who then showed up, and according to the body cam footage that has been released, they began to mock and jeer this distressed and physically ill black man until they violently dragged him off of the property in order to arrest him. Again, this is, this is all on camera, all here in Norman. And I have to wonder, how many haven't been on camera, though? Well, two hours after they arrested Kessie, he was found dead in his cell. Obviously, his distress was warranted. And the officers involved were given paid leave. And that's it. That's all that ever happened to them. I also learned that in 2005, 17-year-old Richard Sanchez was shot 13 times. 13 times, every single one of them was in the back. And the officer who killed him went on to become the architect of the Norman Public Schools Resource Officer Program. You can't make this up. According to the article published by the Norman Transcript on May 19th of 2016, black students constituted about 6.6% of the school population. But a disproportionate share are arrested each year, and that number is growing dramatically. In 2010, 12% of the arrests were black students. That number increased to 26% in 2011. It grew to 28% in 2012, and it climbed all the way to 31% by 2013, and that's where... That's where the Norman transcript was stopped allowed to have statistics. 6.6% of the population is black students, yet 31% of arrests, that's disproportionate, all despite committing disciplinary actions at the same percentile as their white schoolmates. Another article hypothesized, based on this data, that the difference wasn't in the actions of these children, and children is what they are, but that white students were more likely to get suspended for the same actions that a black student would be arrested for. And then we send them into adulthood with a record and an uphill climb and the system is already working against them while it protects white youth. White youth who are very much like me. When I read through some of the things that these students did to get arrested, I was appalled. Mostly because it could have been me. But it wasn't. I always caught the break. 
You see, systemic racism isn't just a problem for big cities. It's a problem right here. But right here is also where we have the most opportunity to do good. And the process begins, of course, in our local elections and protests, in speaking out against these injustices and being informed about the people we're putting in those leadership positions to, to make really significant decisions. But the process also begins, and we, can't, we really can't underestimate how important this is, by educating ourselves and then listening to the stories of our black sisters and brothers. And I said it in that order on purpose. Because as white people, I think we have to get to a point within ourselves that we are trustworthy and worthy of those stories. If you've already started this journey of awakening, the journey of becoming an ally for racial justice, then, I'm sorry, if you haven't really started this journey yet, and this is a waking up point, like it, as it is to so, so many people right now, that's, that's wonderful. I'm really glad that's where you are. Um, There are two books I would highly recommend. The first one is White Awake, An Honest Look at What It Means to Be White by Daniel Hill. Daniel is a pastor in Chicago. The second one I would recommend is White Fragility, Why It is So Hard for White People to Talk About Race by Robin DiAngelo. And you're in luck with the second one there because we're going to be reading White Fragility together this summer and then talking about it together in Zoom meetings on Wednesday nights. The first one of those meetings will be on June 24th, and there's still room in that group if you would like to join that and read that book together. And one really important question you may be asking right now is, why start with two books that are both written by white people? To that I, I would answer that I think we need to understand ourselves and our whiteness first. It helps to understand our own skin more fully before we start walking in someone else's shoes. It opens up the path to empathy, I think. If you've already you know, read those books or looking for other books to read, or maybe you're just looking for something more narrative-based, then I would highly recommend a book called I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. She's a black woman who works in churches and in Christian charities. So she's talking to people like us. And some of her words are difficult to hear, but they're wounds that heal, not harm. And there's also ta Coates' book, Between the World and Me, which is a riveting read. It's about half history, half memoir written to his son. Uh, it's, worth, it's worth checking out. There's also Ibram Kendi who uh, wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist and also stamped from the beginning the definitive history of racist ideas in America if you're looking for those. That's all I'm going to list right now. I maybe listed too many. Um, but it feels like now's the time to probably give too many re- resources rather than too few. I'd rather err on on that side. But I think the education process is the work that we need to begin doing immediately. Many of you are already on that journey, and listen to me, (laughs) we'll really need you to be voices of hope and courage as we all travel this road together. But these are remarkable times And the moment seems to call for something more than just learning and introspection, although that's certainly warranted. So one of the things the Missions Committee voted to do this last week is to give $846 to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund as a symbolic gesture since the officer kneeled on George Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. 
$846 really isn't very much for a church like ours with almost a half a million dollar budget. It's nothing to brag about. It's symbolic, not sacrificial. But it is a symbol of our hope to be an ally on the road to racial justice. And as we know, Symbols are really important. And I highly encourage you to make a gift as well. A tangible action to mark your commitment to this struggle right here, right now. No matter how large or how small that gift is, the really important thing is to put legs to your commitments as fast as possible lest our commitments fade away. So the Missions Committee has a list of organizations that we considered and that we think are, are valuable. And I'll post that list below this video and on our website also. Um, or if you would rather, then you can give that to the church and just mark it what you want that for and, and we'll send it on for you. But picking out the right organization may be the first step in the education process. So I don't want to dissuade you from sending it yourself. And I, I took the time to point out how, frankly, how little our gift is compared to our overall budget on purpose. Um, because I think humility is such an important part of this journey. Arrogance and self-righteousness have, have no place in the Allies' journey. Um, it's one real big problem when uh, I'm preaching <laughs> here for a minute, but one real big problem when people begin to wake up to issues of social justice is self-righteousness and arrogance. And I beg you. Fight, fight that impulse as, as hard as you can. Fight to stay humble. That's, that's where we need, need to be. Um, listening, I think, is one of the most important parts of this journey. Listening to the voice of those who have experienced racism, who have firsthand knowledge of what we're going to be reading about in these books. Shane Claiborne says that when the rich meet the poor, then poverty will be no more. And I, I believe the same is probably true for being an ally for racial justice. We all need friends who are different from us, whose skin and childhood and education and life experiences are different than ours. And we need them to tell us the truth about their experiences. But I make a really important caveat in this point because we can't mistake having a friend who is different from us as being an ally. It's not the same thing. A good many of the racist Facebook posts that I've read this week have started off by saying, I have a black friend, I have a black cousin, or even one that said, I have a black spouse, even. See, proximity to blackness makes no difference at all without empathy and trust. And becoming someone who is trustworthy with their story, with their experiences, makes all the difference in the world. That's, that's why I recommend reading these books first. Second, if at all possible... And, and this may be the more controversial thing I say today, but hear me out. If at all possible, refrain from criticizing how people of color protest. If at all possible, refrain from criticizing how people of color protest. Let the black leaders do it. Because when it comes to white people... <laughs> criticizing how black people protest or even the use of violence, frankly. It comes across as hypocritical and disingenuous of us since 
white violence against black people has been legitimated through slavery and lynching and now the police system. Uh, it's not only that, it's also s simply, it's just not beneficial. Black leaders are speaking and we need to listen to them and we need to trust that their witness is more powerful than ours is on this. And we don't want to do anything to hurt their witness, which is what we risk doing when we start trying to parent their kids. It's difficult, but let black leaders lead. We don't want to do anything to hurt their witness. And if you need to be convinced of that, then go watch Killer Mike's speech in Atlanta. It's a stunning eight minutes. Killer Mike has been a profound voice for a while now, but he is emerging as a national leader in this moment. So let's let, let's let black leaders lead. Let black leaders speak. Now I'll end with this. North Haven, God is reconciling the world to Himself. The kingdom of God is coming, and the biblical story shows that God will use anyone to achieve God's justice, regardless of religiosity or theology or even species. For did not God speak through even a donkey? And when Israel was unjust and threatened the life of a newborn child, didn't God use even those evil Egyptians to protect the young Jesus and save him from harm? The Egyptians. Lord, please don't let the Egyptians outdo us in showing mercy. Way, may we not be so hard of heart that Jesus leaves us the 99, in order to pursue the one. Lord, make us compassionate people, full of courage and conviction, that we might follow Him even into the wilderness. Amen. North Haven, I love you, and I miss you. Our executive committee will be getting together on June 15th to talk about what the next, the next faithful steps forward look like for our congregation. Please be praying for 
us as we try to make a faithful, safe decision. I want to see you again as soon as I can. But I don't want to put any of you at risk to do so. Lord, guide us as we try to make the best decisions and give us the wisdom, the wisdom for today. North Haven, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.